Hey guys, it's Sean O'Connell, the managing editor at Cinema Blend and a co-host of the Real Blend podcast. Here to introduce you to a bonus episode of Real Blend because we have director Ronaldo Marcus Green joining the show for his new film Bob Marley One Love. Um, you know, musical biopics aren't necessarily my genre of choice. I tend to find them a little bit artificial. I prefer a documentary about some of the artists that I grew up loving. Um, or, you know, if I really want to get a deep dive into the inspirations behind, uh, behind a lot of the musicians um, that uh, deserve consideration for uh, a film like Bob Marley, One Love. And obviously, Bob Marley is a legendary musician whose uh, music had incredible impact on, on culture across several decades. Um, so I was sh really shocked to find out how much I enjoyed this new film, Bob Marley, One Love, and a lot of it is due to Ronaldo's direction and also a tremendous lead performance by uh, Kingsley ben Adir. Um, so the film is in theaters now, and I definitely recommend you guys check it out. We review it on the um, full episode of Real Blend. It's going to be dropping on Friday. Um, myself and the boys will weigh in on where we think it sort of falls in the line of musical biopics and um and the impact that it has on Bob Marley's legacy, uh, you know, this kind of ranks alongside some films like while Oliver Stone's The Doors was sort of an origin till the end of Morrison's life. The, I think the reason why I like Bob Marley, One Love so much is because it focuses really heavily on a, a small section of the musician's professional career. And uh, I think by doing that gives us a really good window into the artist. Um, and so it was great to sit down with Ronaldo Marcus Green, uh, following up on his film King Richard, which he made with Will Smith, um, and, and figuring out how he was going to get into the story of Bob Marley and the influence that uh, Marley's son Ziggy Marley had on on the production and the inspirations that he sort of brought to the stories behind the scenes. Um, I will let him tell you all about uh, the making of Bob Marley One Love and the impact that it has had on him since. And if you uh, also want to listen to our conversation uh, with Kingsley, we had that on last week's episode of Real Blend. So go back and find that on either the YouTube channel or the different places your audio needs get met. Um, I'll see you on the other side of the interview to sort of wrap up and tease out what's coming on Friday. But with Without further ado, here is Ronaldo Marcus Green on behalf of his new film, Bob Marley, One Love. How are you doing, Sean? Oh, good. Good to see you again. Um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, an element of Bob's music that I never considered before getting a chance to sit down and watch your film, which is the fact that people took his art um, and they politicized it, whether it was his intention or not. Um and I am curious if that ever made you stop to think about your own films, putting them out into the marketplace and, and getting them the chance to be interpreted in ways that maybe you don't intend um, or, or even politicized in a way that you don't intend. Yeah, I mean, you can't can't predict what's going to happen after the film is released and you never try to make a moment. You never try to make the movie to hit sort of a the timeliness of it. Bob's music was timeless. And I try to take on projects that have that timeless nature to them. There were the films that I grew up watching and do the right thing. It is as timely as it is today as it was when it was first created, but I don't think that's what he was attempting to do. He was trying to make something timeless. And I think that was the approach with this film. Bob's music stands the test of time. It's stronger today than when he first made it. Um, mm. And that's because of the music and the message. And ultimately, it's the story that we're telling that hopefully will do that. Um, you know, we weren't trying to be political and neither was Bob, but that doesn't mean that he could have avoided it. It was just the nature of what he was singing about, where he was singing from, what he was singing, uh, the struggle. And so when I think it was almost impossible for him to avoid it, given, given yeah. you know, what he represented for so many people. And yeah, you know, I think our film certainly tries to uncover who the man is, uh, you know, who Bob is, who the guy behind the T-shirt and the buttons and the bags is um, in the two hour time span that we have with him in our film. There's a quote that um, really struck me hard, which is um, his guitar is his machine gun. And when that gets said, I was like, hell yeah, it is, you know, and it it almost gets laughed down a little bit in the moment, you know, before it's explained. Yeah. And I, this may, 
This, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 I think, I think that's right. You know, it does, I have noticed, it does get a laugh. Um, I think it's, it's who delivers the message in the film. But I think in a good way, you know, it, 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 it allows you to seep into it without being didactic. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a movie that's trying to hammer home a message. Bob's music has a message of unity, peace, and love. Um, sure. But the movie's not trying to hit you over the head with that. It's trying to show you the portrait of a man and dive into the reasons as to why he came up with that music. What was his deep faith in Rastafarianism? Who was he as a husband, as a father, as a, as a musician, as a friend? And show you a slice of that because then I think it brings us closer to closer to the lyrics that we all know or think right. we know. I thought I, I thought I heard his music dozens of hundreds of times before, but I almost felt like I I didn't hear them at all. You know, this movie was a way to to get closer to those to those lyrics to try to understand them. But Ray, specifically, did you ever take the time to just hold hold a guitar, as pretentious as this may sound? And think about the the power and, and the potential influence of, of an instrument like that when it's put in the right hands? Well, the short answer is yes. And uh, I have guitars all over my house. I can't play one string. Um, my father was a musician. Um, and, and he was an attorney by trade, but he, he was a musician. He was, a, you know, had bands through high school. And so music was something that we grew up with in the household. So, I, But he never wanted us to be musicians for whatever reason. Um, I think he was afraid, you know, the lifestyle of musicians and they can be crazy. And so I think he just kind of steered us away from that, even though music was a part of our life. Um, what did he play? What did he like to play? Well, my dad played the, the, he played the electric guitar, he played the bass guitar, he played acoustic. So he was a guitarist uh, and he would play a lot of Santana around the house. That was his thing. He would show off that he could pick like Santana. I was like, yeah, 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 he sounds just like, uh, he was pretty good, man. He was pretty good for, for a novice at home teaching himself how to play. I think he, he did pretty good. It's really funny because I play as well, too, and neither of my boys are interested in it at all. They're they're athletes. They went the other direction. Oh, good, so. good, good, good. I did, too. We, that's exactly what we did was took it into sports. And, you know, I grew up a baseball, football player, and, and those were the, you know, that's how we channeled it. Um, I was so blown away by the look of your film, um, location shots all over the place and, and, and capturing the, the mood and intensity of several specific scenes. And then I get to the end of the film. Shame on me for not knowing this ahead of time, but the contributions of Robert Ellsworth that I was like, oh, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, you had a legend. Yeah, I mean, it was the it was our third collaboration. Uh, I met I met Robert at the Sundance Lab back in 2017. He was just a mentor there at the lab. Fast forward, I have this little movie with Will Smith, uh, King Richard, and I, I remember calling my mentor and just saying I finally had an opportunity uh, to work with him. And uh, that was our first collaboration. And uh, what an incredible one. He's one of my closest friends. Um, uh, just how much time we love, just spend talking about cinema. Um, and so when this project came up, he was the first person I could think of for the, for the film. I thought he would lend an incredible eye, as, as he always does. But he's such a storyteller. The way we location scout, uh, the way we go to each you know, location seven, eight, nine, ten times. Sometimes I'm like, didn't we just go there? We have to go back? Like He's just one of those <laughs> folks that he needs to be in the space seven, eight, nine times before we ever step foot on the set. And it's amazing. Okay. And look, so, sometimes it's just time of day. It needs to go there in the morning, it needs to go there in the afternoon, it needs to go there at night, it needs to go there, you know, several times for several different reasons. And, and, and that process has been so helpful for me. Um, just seeing how he works, you know, he's what, 70 something years old and, and still has the energy of a, of a 25 year old, just an incredible energy, incredible spirit, incredible storyteller. Um, yeah, he's, he, he brought an incredible cinematic eye to this film. Uh, I don't think a film has ever been captured this way in Jamaica um, on this level, with this scale, um, with the level of care, with the lighting. I mean, just the details. He's very detail oriented, but but a heart of gold. And I think you feel that in every shot. How um, open is he to a creative pivot? Uh, in the moment is, is 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 as much of it planned in advance as possible or are very, you guys both still discovering things on the day very we rarely use marks um it's not a thing that we we do and i think it's because mm -hmm. of the way we go into the into the location scouting is 
we're so prepped with how we're going to be to give the actor the flexibility to, you know, feel natural in the space, especially when you're shooting on sets, which oftentimes we were. This was a period piece, so we had to build a lot of our sets and we wanted that to feel natural. You know, when the actors are looking outside and blue screens, they're not there. So how do we make that feel organic so that they can get lost? You know, sometimes mm -hmm. the actors can do it with props, they can do it with locations, but oftentimes it's not getting tripped up with camera and those things. And I think a lot of our rehearsal is giving freedom to the actors. And so I'll go in as the actor and block the scene. Uh, and Robert will just be like, could you do it over there? There'll be like a lighting thing. Like, could you, could you do the same thing, but just kind of steer them in a way that they find the light. So it's kind of guiding the actors towards the light without telling them to hit it in a way that feels organic and natural. So I think, look, our, it, 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 there's so many different tricks to the trade when it comes to, mm -hmm. you know, making things feel organic and natural and lived in. And I think that's what he does so well in, 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 in all of his films. Yeah. Um, Ray, is there any comparison at all to the energy needed to shoot uh, a tennis match versus a live concert setting? A, a thousand percent. I mean, I think this whole film felt like like we were at Wimbledon. You know, it felt <laughs> like it felt like, you know, the World Cup or the Super Bowl, like every single down was that intense. And I just mm -hmm. think it's because it was Bob Marley. I mean, the the magnitude of the man that we were trying to portray. Everybody knows who Bob is. He's, every, he's some of your favorite musicians, favorite musicians. So mm. don't mess with Bob, <laughs> you know? So like <laughs> whether we were doing an insert or, you know, a 300 person crowd shot, everything was taken with that high intensity. It was a fourth down with, you know, inches. It just felt like that. It was, it was the nature of this movie. It, it needed to have that high bar. Um, you know, and look, we, we already knew, like some of the folks in Jamaica were like, N you know, like, like you, you can't reach a, it's like, well, what do you mean? I haven't even, I haven't even started. What do you mean? I can't reach a, because Bob is perfect, right? Bob is held yeah. in such high regard, but that didn't mean that we shouldn't attempt to try to get to a, a plus, like that was the goal, whether we could reach it or not. We were trying to get as close to po close to that as possible, not by trying to mimic Bob, but, but by trying to get the essence of who he was, we could never, there's only one Bob Marley, this will forever be, but Kingsley's job, our job, our responsibility was to get close to the essence of who he was. Um, and I think we I think we were able to achieve that. Well, and it can't work without the family's um, support, I would assume. A absolutely not. I wouldn't have even taken on the project that the family wasn't involved. And, that, and that's coming off of King Richard. Having Isha Price on set was invaluable to the process of making the movie. And I knew, yeah. look, number one, for the rights of the music. I mean, I want, if I'm going to a Bob Marley movie i want to i want to hear bob's voice yeah and then just to have ziggy on set every day it was like having an extension of bob on set i mean his his mannerisms his disposition his fight his spirit i mean he's the literal dna i mean you're you're like he's that's bob in so many ways and through all of his children sadella read you know rita his wife just having that access was such an invaluable resource not only for me but I know for sure Kingsley, Lashana, our actors, our, 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 our crew, um, just to get access to spaces, photographs that are not accessible to the public, archives that are not accessible to the public. Um, mm -hmm. It was so meaningful to us. I think it only made the film uh, richer. Ray, you make a choice that, that some documentaries or some musical bi uh, biopics choose to do and some don't, which is to show actual footage of, of Bob at the end, you know? Yeah. And it's uh, and we instantly compare it to Kingsley and we realize, damn, like he got he got so close. Yeah. Was that always the intention? Was it always you were going to end with with putting actual Bob footage at the end? Yeah. You know, I think so. I think we always had an inclination that you want to see Bob. You want to remember him. Um, hmm. How and what was still TBD, I think, early. Didn't know exactly what footage we were going to use, what we can license. But I think you want to see Bob at the end of the movie. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it's so special when you see him show up at the end of our film. And, and I think it's because of the way Kingsley carried that torch. 
the responsibility yeah. carried how, you know, like you said, how close he got to the essence of who Bob was. Um, and I think you take that leap of faith once you start watching the film, you start watching the performance, you start watching the language and you forget, you forget you're watching Kingsley. You, you, you're just on the journey. You're on the journey of Bob and this man on a mission, someone that, you know, was thrust in this political situation and is now feeling like he's losing a sense of time. He's in exile and he has to create, he has to create this music. And it's, and it's, it's, it's amazing. You're, you're getting a VIP ticket into his life the musical creation, a musical genius. And hopefully you for, you just forget. You're just like, wow, like, is that how he created Exodus? Is that how he wrote? Uh, you know, is it, and it's, and, and, and it's, I know for me, that's that filling in the blanks there was the most fun part. It was mm -hmm. the things we didn't know about Bob. I didn't know that Rita had introduced them to Rastafarianism. Um, the thing, you know, the, the single, probably the single most important thing in Bob's, evolution as a man and a musician, his yeah. faith, you know, it wasn't just a cool hairstyle, you know, Bob, right. Bob, Bob lived that life. Um, it was a lifestyle and, um, it was a religion and he, he went after it relentlessly. Um, yeah, it was amazing. I'm curious what your direction was to Kingsley in a extremely striking moment, which I was completely unaware of, which is Bob getting shot in the kitchen. Um, that scene is incredibly tense, but Kingsley never flinches at all. He seems to come to terms, you know, he seems to have a peace about him. And I thought that that was really fascinating. Yeah, I think a lot of it came down to what was happening in the story at that time. There were, mm -hmm. there were um, stories about Bob having seen the, uh, having visions and he had a vision of the day he was shot. And supposedly he saw that moment happen before it happened. Um, and we wanted to try to slow the moment down as if that was true, um, as if that was real, um, that he knew who the shooters from Trenchtown were. That was, okay. that was true. And so obviously in, in movie language, it's about extending that moment so that we get a visual of who the shooter is, that we know who the guys from Trenchtown were. We wanted the audience to know that. And so we could create this moment. And then I think we wanted a jovial moment before that, Bob, you know, I think it was Neville Garrick who was on set that said he was juggling grapefruits. So it was just however <laughs> we could steal the authenticity of what was happening. And, you know, Neville was there that night. He was the one that drove Judy home. And so he okay. left before it happened. So he doesn't actually know, but he knows but he knew. And so it was just about, it was about creating the space for the actors, for the actors to, you know, make that happen for their looks to last long enough for us to understand what Bob must have been going through in that moment, his right. life flashing before his eyes. And, you know, it's divine intervention. I mean, to survive yeah. an attack like that is divine intervention. Um, that's the only way I can put it. And it wasn't his time. His time was to give us this music. He wasn't meant to go then. Um, and yeah, so he did, he did, he maximized his time on earth, uh, more than any other human being. I think I've, I've come to know. Absolutely. Um, it, the film makes a, a very, um, fascinating left turn briefly, uh, into the London punk scene. Yeah. That had to be a really fun scene to shoot. And, and did you, Include that to to maybe suggest that that music happening at that moment and, and the chaos that so, sort of surrounded it influenced Bob to a certain extent. Absolutely. Bob was influenced by his surroundings and, and you know, whether it's a, the line in any of his songs, Hail Georgie, Georgie's a guy from Trenchtown on the streets. It's the same with The Clash. You know, he was in London. He was in exile and The Clash was happening. Punk scene, riot scene uh, against the police, you know, resisting. Uh, very similar to what was happening in reggae and, 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 and at that time. So, yeah, we wanted to show it, it drops you in a place in time. Uh, it was real. Uh, and it, it, it was also fun. Yeah, like you said, it was a lot of fun to shoot and to show just the contrast between these Rastas in a, in a foreign land and how they, yeah. you know, how they so, so different, but still the same. And I think that unity is what Bob speaks about. It's what he sings mm -hmm. about. It's what's in his message. Um, he didn't discriminate. That was Bob, man. He didn't discriminate. Um, and, and yeah, I think we wanted to show that contrast 
uh, you know, and and yeah, what 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 fun what fun scenes to shoot? Can I tell you my absolute favorite moment, please? In the film? So it's recording um, of Simmer Down in the recording studio <laughs> at an early age. And it pans back into the production booth and the engineer is, is dancing. He just can't stop himself. He's dancing. <laughs> and I love those moments of just pure, unadulterated joy that comes together when, when the right notes are being played, you know, and, and you can feel it. Can you talk about capturing that? Yeah, that was also one of my favorite moments. I, you could, you know, you could hear me in the, you know, behind the monitor saying, go nuts, go nuts. I'm just yelling at es Esveraldo, our actor. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, at first it was a little tame and I was like, no, 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 like, you really love this. Like, this is amazing. Yeah. And then he gets up on the <laughs> table and he does this thing. And I'm like, that's it. That's it. It was like we were all I think everybody in that room, your 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 face just lights up. I mean, it's impossible not to. And if I'm yeah. doing that in the room on this tiny monitor, I can only imagine what the audience is doing when they see that. And we needed the film needed that. You know, we have an introspective film, one that's uh, that. That shows you the inner interior struggle of Bob. And so when we cut to these flashbacks and these moments that showed you the a younger, more peaceful time, a more innocent time in Bob's life, in contrast to what he's going through in our current A timeline, I think I think it helps to bolster those those moments to show you that contrast. Here was a guy that was, you know, just loved music. It was all about the music. And and then life got complicated. Life got complicated, right? Politics got complicated. His role and the demand on him got complicated. And I think that's why those, mo those moments of levity, they really pop in our film and, and really help to, you know, carry the rest of the performance. Do you think he gets enough credit for being the, a musician and a songwriter? I mean, I would say, you know, there are people that are going to discover Bob with this film, and mm. I'm really happy that they will. Our, my kids will grow up with the, with learning about Bob Marley through Kingsley Benadire and Lashana Lynch and Rita Marley. So, yeah, I think they'll have a newfound appreciation for just what a musical genius he was. Yeah. I think there's an assumption that when you're talented, that things just fall out of the skies. Films are just made. But it's that's just not how it works, you know. It, yeah, it, it takes an incredible amount of work ethic, and 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 Bob was just that guy. They said he didn't sleep; he just rested his eyes. I mean, what? What do you mean? Like he just worked tirelessly. And right. I know so many people on this film did that in front of him, behind the camera. Um, you know, I never put myself in front of in front of the film in that way. The, this film was a spiritual film. Um, Bob's music was, uh, was an incredible gift to us. It was really the spine of this movie. And it was up to us to sort of unpack that gift a little bit. You know, let's, yeah. let's, let's, let's get closer to what this man was all about and what he was singing for. Well, I appreciated when you took the efforts to sort of show his steps in the, produ in, um, the studio, you know, to almost say that like, yeah, there's a jovial rhythm to this music and there's a party atmosphere, but you know, the one guy's drinking Red Stripe and, and he was like, no, 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 it's real. It's time to work now. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Because it definitely was time to work. And and Bob, you, you know, you, you heard it from the band members, people that were there. Neville Garrick was a, a consulting producer on the set. Rest his soul. He, we, we lost him recently. But he just talked about Bob being just that he orchestrated. He orchestrated that he was able to capture something that other people he was thinking about frequency and sound and marketing. I mean, he had his hands in everything. Um, mm -hmm. He was very, very hyper aware of everything that was happening. Um, so yeah, it was just, it was great to capture some of that. And obviously through Kingsley's performance and the research that he brought to the table and the homework that he did, um, it really helped to, to capture the essence of, of Bob. All right, I'll get you out of here on this one. Um, this is a personal one. There's a great moment in the, in the film where Bob hears a, a movie soundtrack and it, it influences him. It changes him, essentially. So what is one from from your childhood that the first time you heard it, it just changed everything for you? Oh, man. Movie soundtrack. I mean, E.T., uh, probably. Um, yeah, I mean, what kid wasn't just like, what's this? This is probably the greatest thing ever and uh, one of the greatest yeah. movies ever made. Um, Spielberg, one of the greatest to ever do it. So, um, 
Yeah. That John that, Williams is going to go places, I feel. I think, I think he's got a pretty good career. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I love this movie. It was really great. Thank and, you so uh, much. I, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and opening up about it. I can't wait to tell people to go see it. So Likewise. thanks, Ray. All right. Appreciate you. Thank you. We want to thank our good friends at Paramount and, of course, Ronaldo for coming on the show. It's always great to have a director of a big movie like this coming to theaters. Um, I can't, like I said, I can't recommend this movie enough. Uh, whether you're a fan of Bob Marley or not, his music, you're going to recognize it. Of course, it's prevalent. Um, and as someone who doesn't listen to a ton of Bob Marley, I found like I learned a lot about him as an artist and as a person. Um, and Kingsley's terrific Lashana Lynch is fantastic in this movie. And I just thought Ronaldo does a really good job of putting us in the shoes of this artist as he sort of struggles between his artistic inspiration and the political needs of his home in Jamaica. So really interesting story, one that you should definitely take time to, to check out. And if you want to, you know, go out of your way and see it in a Dolby theater because the sound and the music is that's basically the way that it deserves to be um, to be experienced. So that's how I would recommend you guys see it on Friday's episode of Real Blend. We are going to have um, S.J. Clarkson, who is the director of the new film, Madam Web. We're going to review fully uh, Madam Web and Bob Marley, One Love. And we play a um, Oscars in review, which is always a fun game to get to. So uh, hit subscribe, turn on your notifications. Thank you for joining us here uh, on the latest episode of Real Blend. We really appreciate all that you guys do to support the show. Make sure you tell a friend about it if they are a movie lover as well. And we'll see you back here the next time a new episode of Real Blend drops and is ready for you guys.